Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Izzy from PowerliftingToWin.com, and today we're going to talk about how to squat. So in the last few videos that I've put out, I've covered really the scientific basis for why I recommend that you use a wide stance low bar squat. So what this video is really going to be about is just how to do it. I'm not going to include so many explanations about mechanics and lever arms and really the why, how, the, the why behind what I'm saying. This is mostly going to be how. If you're interested in the finer details and really my arguments and justifications for the techniques that I'm suggesting here, then I'm going to go ahead and direct you to the description box where I'm going to put some links to some really extensive articles that I've written on the subject. Okay, so the first topic we're going to cover in this video is bar position. How do you actually get into a low bar squat? Let's take a look. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do is take your grip on the bar. Now, I'm sure you guys are wondering, okay, well, what does that mean? Where do I put my hands on the bar? And here's the thing. You want to take as narrow of a grip as you can. The wider your grip is, the more spread out your upper back muscles are going to be. And the bar rests on the shelf made by your upper back. So take a look at the right picture and then compare it to the left picture. You can clearly tell that the closer your grip is, the tighter those muscles are going to be and the more stable your rack position is going to be. So take the narrowest grip that your shoulder flexibility will allow. Okay, so the next thing you're going to want to do is slide yourself underneath the front of the bar. And you're going to jam your upper body over the bar so that your rear delts, where the bar actually sits when you low bar, is above the bar itself. You want to jam yourself up there as high as you can. Next, you're going to squeeze your shoulder blades together and get your upper back as tight as you can and push backwards against the bar and slide it across your back until the bar clicks into place right above your rear delts. Okay, watch closely how it clicks into place. If you follow this process, you'll get the perfect low bar rack position every single time. And here's the whole thing from start to finish so you can see what it looks like in continuity. One quick note guys, you may have noticed that I was using a thumbs around grip with bent wrists. You can only get away with this if you're wearing wrist wraps. Without wrist wraps, using a bent wrist on the squat is going to make the weight press down against your wrist and your wrists are going to intercept some of the load and it's just a great way to get tendonitis. It's bad for your wrists, so I don't recommend it. If you don't have wrist wraps, you should widen your grip out a little bit so that you can hold your wrist straight on the bar. Now, if you don't have wrist straps but you want to get some, I'll go ahead and throw up a link in the description box so you can get the exact same pair of 36-inch Titan RPMs that I'm using in this video. Okay, guys, for the reasons that we covered in the last video, I've recommended a wide stance squat. So the question really becomes, how wide is wide? And realistically, your stance width is going to be determined by three different factors. Factor number one is the ability to hit depth. The wider you stand, the harder it is on your flexibility and mobility. So if you can't hit depth, you can't use that stance because you have to hit depth to follow the rules. Your squats just don't count if you don't hit depth. The second determinant is whether or not you can keep your knees out. Remember, if you're not keeping your knees out in external rotation, you're defeating the purpose of standing that wide anyways. We're not standing wide just to look good. We're standing wide to reduce the lever arms between the hip and the bar and the knee and the bar. And we're doing that because our leg is rotated out. If you allow your knees to cave in, that's really the same thing as internally rotating the femur. And when you internally rotate the femur you increase the horizontal distance between the hip and the knee and it's, it just defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do and the third thing that determines stance width is something that not a lot of people talk about and that is your individual anthropometry people have different bones it's just not something that gets talked about enough Hip sockets and femurs are shaped differently some of them attach straight in and some of them attach at an angle let's take a look Okay, so let's take a look at these two different pairs of femurs and hips. Let's start with the femurs. You notice that one femur basically attaches at a right angle, whereas the other one is clearly on a diagonal. 
and and the shape of those femurs and the tie and the way that they articulate in the hip joint is going to prevent certain ranges of motion from being feasible it has nothing to do with mobility or a tight hip joint capsule it's literally a bone getting in the way so take a look at the hips too the hip on the far right has a straight out attachment whereas the hip on the left there seems to point to the front and down. Do you think that's gonna have an impact on what stance works the best? Of course it is. So my recommendation for those of you who get hip pain from a wider stance is narrow your stance. You need to take as wide of a stance as your hips will allow. And if you're getting joint pain, it's very unlikely that it's due to poor mobility. It's more likely that your body structure just can't support that stance width. So unfortunately for you, you're going to have to take a narrower stance. Okay, so next we're going to address the ability to hit depth. In the next picture, I'm going to show you three squats side by side. One of them is going to be narrow, the other one is going to be medium, and the last one will be a wide stance squat. And if you're wondering what my definitions are for those stances, well, in this picture right here, you can see the one on the left is going to be the narrow stance squat, the one in the middle is the medium stance squat, and the one on the far right represents a wide stance squat. So with that in mind, let's go to the next picture. Okay, so out of these three squats, you can tell that the one on the far right is the one that is the most difficult for me to reach depth with, and that's just because of how wide it is. Now, here's the thing. Is that depth? Well, it would probably depend if you're an IPF competitor or if you compete elsewhere, but the bottom line is for me, since I aspire to compete in the IPF, that is not going to work. However, there's only 135 pounds on the bar. If there was 315 pounds on the bar, I would be able to get to depth with that far stance on the right. That said, I use the stance in the middle because the stance on the far right, I cannot keep my knees out. So let's see what that means. Okay, so let's compare these two pictures here. The one on the left is an incorrect squat with the knees caving in in a valgus position. The squat on the right is good. The knees are out. The reason why this is important is because when we push our knees out, it decreases the moment arm between the hips and the bar without shoving the knees forward, which basically means that we can lift the, the same weights much more easily, right? So if you cannot keep your knees out with a stance that is a particular width, you defeat the purpose of using that stance width because your femurs rotate inward and it takes away the advantage that you were getting in the first place. And that is why I don't use an ultra wide stance. I can actually hit depth with it with enough weight, but I can't hold my knees out. It's something that I'm working on and it might be something that you need to work on as well as you widen your stance out over time. So one thing I wanted to note before you decide that you can't reach depth with a certain stance or you can't hold your knees out is that the wider you stand, the more you're going to need to rotate your foot. And the reason for this is because when we push our knees out, we want to keep our knees in line with our toes. If they're inside of the toes, we create a moment arm between the knee and the toe. And if they're outside of the toes, well, we also create a moment arm between the knee and the toe. And we don't want to do that. It's not it's unhealthy for the knee for them to be either exaggeratedly pushed out or caving in. So if you take a wider stance, you're going to need to experiment with the exact degree of, you know, of foot angle that you need to best facilitate getting your knees out. But that is the number one criteria. Take the foot angle which best helps you keep your knees out. Okay, now that we know where we're putting our feet and hands, we need to be able to walk the weight out to squat it. So here's the thing. The wider that you stand for your squat, the more complicated that your walkout has to be. If you have a very wide stance squat, you might need four steps for your walkout. If you have a narrow stance squat, you really only need two steps. If you're somewhere in between, well, you need some the steps that are in between, right? A lot of people don't take their walkout seriously, but you should. If you don't practice your walkout on every single rep, when you get to heavier weights, those same sloppy habits that you develop during your warm-ups and in training are going to cost you out of meat as you're sitting there wasting energy trying to get the weight balanced when realistically you should have practiced your walkout thousands of times and have been able to do the walkout in your sleep. So let's take a look at the exact methods that you can use to walk the weight out. Okay guys, here's the two-step walkout for narrow stance squatters. I'll first show it to you normal speed and then in slow motion.
Here's the three step walkout for medium wide squatters. Okay, so here's the four-step walkout. Basically, the four-step walkout is just the two-step walkout, and then you take an additional step on each side to widen your feet. This is a technique that used to be used by geared lifters before monoliths became so prevalent. Okay, now that we know where to put our hands, our feet, and how to walk the weight out, there's one step left before we can actually squat, and that's the pre-squat setup. And the whole point of the pre-squat setup is to do this thing called get tight that you'll constantly hear in powerlifting. Now, what does tightness even mean? It's kind of an interesting question. Really what people are talking about is just making sure that there's no slack in your system. Any slack that's in your system before you move a heavy weight has to get pulled out before force can be efficiently transferred. So imagine that you have a piece of string tied to something and you want to tug something around. Well, in order for the string to transfer any of that force, First, it has to be pulled taut. You can think of the same thing with your muscles. Unless everything is tight, it's not going to transfer force until some of that force pulls it tight. And we don't want to waste force production tightening our body when we could have done that before the movement even started. So, let's take a look at my exact setup for getting tight before the squat. Okay guys, step one is to do something called chest up. That's the cue, chest up. But what chest up really means is it means set your whole back into extension. You want to take out all the slack from your back by flexing everything in your back, okay? Set your back by putting it into extension. That means no rounding in the back. And, and your chest going up is just a product of you setting your back. Okay, so the next step is to pull the bar down. And what this does is we're literally going to pull the bar down with our hands. And what it does is it activates the lats. And when the lats are tight, it makes it so much easier to maintain your back angle throughout the movement. And if we're maintaining a stable back angle, we're more efficiently transferring force. Less wasted energy means more weight on the bar. Now, I'm going to play this again in slow motion so you can really see what it looks like because it's very hard to see unless you're watching for it. Okay, here it comes, watch. Okay, so step three is that we're gonna take a giant breath, as big as we can, and hold all that air in. And what this does, it's called the Valsalva Maneuver, and, and it's going to pressurize your entire core. And that's going to more effectively stabilize the spinal column. And because the lower back is what transfers force, when we more effectively stabilize the core, again, more efficient force transfer, Less energy wasted, more weight on the bar, bigger lifts, you're a better power lifter. Okay, this next step is also really subtle. It's called packing the neck. Packing the neck means that you're going to also get your neck tight. You're going to flex your neck. Not put your neck into flexion by bending it forward. Not extend your neck by bending it backwards, but flex the actual muscles. Get those muscles tight. You're going to pack it down and back. Okay, I'm going to put this in slow motion so you can see, again, this subtle movement that does increase your efficiency. Watch closely. And finally, the last step is your squat. Okay, next we're going to talk about the most common form errors in the squat. This is by no means a comprehensive list of everything that you could possibly mess up in the squat. But what it is, is a list of things that maybe... The technique that I've talked about thus far doesn't directly fix if you follow it. So I want to cover again these points because they're so important for maximizing your efficiency and moving big weights. Okay guys, the number one cardinal sin of squatting technique is not hitting depth. Not only does it automatically disqualify your lift, but powerlifters don't respect high squatters, period. All right, guys, I just want to include a basic example of what not getting to depth looks like. We're looking for the crease of the hip to drop below the knee. And in this video, it just clearly doesn't. 
And from here, we're just gonna go head on down all the rest of the way to depth. And that's what depth is. Hip crease below the top of the knee. So one of the errors that we already addressed was being able to hold your knees out, particularly at the bottom of the squat. But it can also happen on the ascent as well, and it's just as bad. Let's take a look. One of my all-time favorite quotes from strength training is by Mark Ripito, and it goes like this, poor form is caused by insufficient yelling. And if you're one of the people who squats with knees like that, you need a training partner to yell at you, knees out. And here's the proper knee position, knees out in line with your toes. That's what it should look like. One of the biggest technical mistakes you can make when squatting is something called getting forward. Now, what does that mean? It usually happens when you rock onto your toes on the bottom of the squat. And the reason why it's such a bad thing to have happen is that when you rock onto your toes, you go off of the midfoot balance point. And any time that you're off balance, any weight that you're trying to lift, the leverage against you becomes worse. And so anything that you're lifting becomes heavier than it really is. You're artificially increasing the weight and making it harder on yourself. You have to keep the bar over the middle of your foot. Let's take a look at what this error looks like. Okay, as the lifter gets to the bottom of the squat, I want you to watch what happens here. The bar tips forward of midfoot. Go ahead and draw an imaginary line in your mind from the very middle of the foot up to where the bar should be. The distance between the bar and that imaginary line is called a moment arm. And the leverage that's acting against us on any given lift is the sum total of the moment arms involved in the movement. So there's a gap between the knee and the bar and a gap between the hips and the bar. And when we add those two distances together, we, get an appro we can approximately calculate how much moment force we have to overcome, how much leverage we have to overcome. Well, when you tip forward of midfoot, you're adding another moment arm between your foot and the bar, and it's making the weight harder than it needs to be. So you have to avoid this error if you want to lift the most weight possible. Luckily, the fix for this error is pretty simple. Just keep your chest up. That's the only cue you need to, to remember. Chest up. Now, just because we want to keep our chest up doesn't mean that we actually lead the movement with our chest. We don't drive our chest up. We drive our ass up. We drive our hips up, okay? And the reason for that is, remember why we chose the low bar squat. We chose the low bar squat because it allowed us to use more posterior chain. And the posterior chain is a bigger, larger group of muscles than the quads. We'd rather have more hip extension than more knee extension as a raw squatter. So... When you pick up your chest coming out of the hole, you throw your knees forward. What we really want is to maintain our back angle throughout the whole movement. Let's take a look at what this error actually looks like. Okay, I want you to pay extra close attention to the lifter's knees and hips as they try to come out of the bottom. See how they jerk forward like that? That's what happens when you lead with your chest. You throw your knees forward and you throw your hips forward at the same time. And yes, this makes it easier on your hips, but it makes it much harder on your quads. And we want to use more hips because, the, again, the hips are bigger and stronger. We don't want to add more leverage to the knees by taking away leverage from the hips. So instead of leading with the chest, let's, I want to show you a picture of what it looks like when you lead with the hips. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, we have two pictures of the bottom of the squat. And on the right-hand side, we have the two options for the way you can begin your ascent. You can either drive your chest up or you can drive your hips up. Now, I want you to pay close attention to where the knees and hips are in both pictures. On the bottom right-hand corner, the back angle hasn't changed from the bottom left-hand corner. It's opened a little bit, but that's only because of where we are in the movement. You'll notice that the knee position is actually, if anything, back a little bit because we've led with the hips. The hips are taking most of the leverage. Whereas on the picture on the top, we're leading with the knees, and the knees are way out over the toes, and they're working overtime to go ahead and finish this movement. We don't want the quads responsible for the most leverage in the movement. They're just not as big and strong as the hips. So make sure you drive with your hips. If you find yourself leading with your chest, the cue to fix it is simple, hip drive. Okay, so the last technique issue that I wanna talk about here is descent speed. It seems like people either fall into one of two extremes at this. They either go too slow or way too fast. Now here's the criteria that we want for a successful descent. 
When you descend under a load, when you have an eccentric contraction that is loaded, what ends up happening is something called a stretch reflex. That is, the muscles, when they reach the end of their extensibility while under a load, will stretch and actually contract harder than they normally do. And the speed of the stretch corresponds very well to the intensity of it, meaning that the faster that you do this, the stronger the stretch reflex that you'll get. And we want to take advantage of this because it lets us lift more weight. But at the same time, people go too far. And what they end up doing is relaxing something so that they can literally drop into the bottom. Now, remember, what happens when you relax anything in the kinetic chain? Well, it creates slack, and that slack has to be eaten up at some point before we can get efficient force transfer. And we don't want to waste energy, so we need to compromise between both of those things. We need to descend as fast as we can to get the best stretch relief flex, but we need to stay as tight as possible so that we don't waste any force when we're transferring it from the bottom of the squat. I really can't emphasize enough that this video was actually the short version of my article on squat technique. So if you if you still have some questions about this, feel free to leave a comment and I'll, I'll do my best to answer. But I highly recommend that if you enjoyed this video, if you thought it was useful, to really read those articles because they're just 10 times better than these videos. It will help you understand the squat on a whole new level. And, you know, I, I think that if you like my videos, you'll definitely like my writing more. Anyways, the article links will be in the description box. And for those of you that wanted to maybe check out where to get some wrist wraps, I'll throw that in there for you too. If you'd like, if you guys have any feedback on this video in terms of what you'd like to see in future technique videos, please let me know because I'm about to put out a series on the bench and deadlift as well. Anyways, guys, I really hope that was useful. If you like the content, Please subscribe. It helps a lot. And as always, check out powerliftingtowin.com for more great powerlifting information. Have a good one.